Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this, the first edition of the Heart and Stroke Dialogue hosted by Brimstone and Life Vincent Pallotti Hospital in association with the Heart and Stroke Foundation and SMAL 90.4 FM. I'd like to extend a special welcome to all the Heart and Stroke champions here tonight, both those that will be joining us on stage and those in the audience. So in context, let's look at some stats. Uh, 225 South Africans are killed by heart diseases every day. 10 people on average suffer a stroke in South Africa in every hour. Fortunately, as you'll hear tonight, about 80% of heart disease and stroke can be prevented. One of our key objectives of this dialogue is to empower you with useful information about heart disease and stroke. And another is to encourage a simple lifestyle change uh, that will contribute to healthy living. Please do engage with the exhibitors in the foyer, Life Healthcare, Sea Harvest, Lucky Star, uh, for some of the Heart Foundation endorsed products, Brimstone Iteco Sport and Athletic Club, and also the Heart and Stroke Foundation. I would like to welcome the dedicated team of medical specialists from Life Vincent Pilati Hospital who have taken time out to be with us this evening and to share their experience with us. They'll be joining us in the second part of the dialogue, which will entail a question and answer session. This evening's event is being broadcast live on two community stations, Radio Zebanele and Radio Voice of the Cape, and I'd like to welcome all the listeners. And I'd like to encourage the listeners out there who are listening to participate by sending their questions to the panel via SMS, and we'll make uh, every attempt to have them all answered. We also have reason to celebrate today. Today marks the 21st anniversary of Brimstone's listing on the JC. It has been an incredible journey, and we thank you all for your support over the many years. This year also happens to be the 20th anniversary of the highly acclaimed cardiac unit at Life Vincent Pilati Hospital. I believe it's in October this year. So congratulations to the VP team, VP meaning Vincent Pilati. There will be snacks and entertainment in the foyer uh, just after the event, so please feel free to interact with the panelists after the, uh, after the event. And do use the hashtags for social media, which is on the screen just in front of me. Uh, it's hashtag heart and stroke, and Twitter handles at brimstone ltd and at lifehealthcare underscore. I'd now like to welcome our host for this evening, uh, Benito Vigatini from Smile 90.4 FM, who will uh, take over from me and uh, he'll host uh, the panelists and the question and answer session. Benito, for your information, hosts The Honest Truth on Smile 90.4 FM on Mondays to Thursdays, so please tune in. He tackles some really relevant issues. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the session, and uh, we'll chat some more later. Welcome, Benito. mentioned my name's Benito Vigatini and I'm from Smile 90.4 FM. I'm the host of the weekday talk show The Honest Truth which happens Monday to Thursday between 8 and 10. Incidentally also sponsored um, by Brimstone and with the latest listing maybe that sponsorship will also set to continue for a few years but a big thank you so much um, to all of you to be a part of this discussion and Discussions like these, I feel, are quite important because these are wonderful platforms to get invaluable information around our bodies so that we can, in fact, apply it to our lives to lead healthier and preventative lives. Now, this evening, as Nizai had mentioned, we'll have a panel of experts who will answer your heart and stroke-related questions. But before that, I'd like to introduce you to two gentlemen who will be sharing two inspirational accounts. They are both heart and, and stroke survivors. The one is a stroke survivor, both heart attack survivors. 
The one is an active individual who, prior to his heart attack, led a very healthy and active lifestyle. The other gentleman had three heart attacks, of which he was unaware of. Um, it was, funnily enough, a tummy pain and abdominal um, um, discomfort that got him to the hospital, and upon then it was discovered what had happened. So let's just find out from their particular stories as well. Do remember to be a part of the discussion on Twitter, hashtag heart and stroke, capital H, capital S, at Brimstone Limited, at Life Healthcare underscore. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Clive Liberty and Brian Smith. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us and for being a part of the discussion this evening. Clive, if I, can, if I can start with you, before your heart attack, how would you describe your lifestyle? Um, to be quite honest, uh, not very healthy lifestyle. Uh, it was, if I could just say, normal. Yes. You know, uh, eating the hamburgers and yes. fish and chips and all stuff right. like that. So not at all a healthy lifestyle. And at the time of the heart attack, I remember you were telling me that you were working at ESCOM. Not that there's, that there's a link between the two. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but what had happened to you, Clive? Yes, uh, the February 2015 started out as a perfectly normal day. And I went to work. And as I was preparing to uh, leave to come home, uh, one of my colleagues uh, looked at me and said to me, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine, because I never felt any different to what I felt like the morning. But then this person said to me, but your color has changed completely. And I thought in my own mind, ah, this person is crazy, you know. And then I drove home, and that was in Balbo, and then I stay in the southern suburbs in Grassy Park. And I drove home from Balbo to Grassy Park, scratched around a little bit at home, and uh, the evening I didn't feel so well. And then my wife insisted that I go to see a doctor. Of course, the, by this time, the doctors were all gone. I think it was about 7, 8 the evening. And uh, they took me to Constantiaburg because I had severe abdominal pains. You know, so I thought, ah, it's just a gastric stomach or something like that. And the thought of cardiac arrest, Not heart at attack, all. didn't enter into no, your mind? No, because I come from a family with a history of heart attacks. My mom passed away from a heart attack. She had seven heart attacks. Mm. And uh, then she eventually passed away, unfortunately. So I knew that it was in the family, but when I had this abdominal pains, I thought, no, it can't be, because she always said to me, you know, the left arm and the chest yes. pains. So I had no symptoms of a heart attack. But anyway, I went to uh, Constantiaburg, and then it was a lady doctor that treated me there, and she treated me for a gastric stomach. And then she came to me afterwards, she asked me, how was the pain? I asked the pain, and I said, no, I've still got this terrible tummy pain. And she asked me if she could keep me there for the, for the night. I said, yeah, sure. Yes. And then I stayed, they booked me into the ward, and uh, about three, four o'clock the next morning, early morning, she came to me and she said to me, you can forget about going home. She said, I've now just established that you had a heart attack at work, and while you were here, you've had another two heart attacks. And I thought... What went through your mind at that, at well, that then, point? Then I became scared. But then, of course, you know, trust the instincts of a woman. I thought, ah, it's a lady doctor. <coughs> uh, lady must be, must be correct. Yes. And uh, then uh, the next morning... Uh, about 8, 9 o'clock, she said to me, I must go see the cardiologist. And I went to see the cardiologist at uh, Constantiaburg. It was uh, Dr. Daud. And uh, he put me on all the equipment there, and he actually scolded me. And he said to me, look how you damaged your heart. Because apparently the whole muscle of the heart had collapsed. The bottom part of the, of the heart had collapsed already. My word. And then he said to me, you must go through to Vincent Pilotti immediately. And I said, no, sure, doctor, I'll go. And I thought, to hang with you, if I'm finished here now, I'm going home, you know? <laughs> because I was feeling fine. 
And then he said to me, no, 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 no. You're going with the ambulance. I'll get an ambulance for you. I said, no, doctor, it's fine. My wife will come. I'll go to Vincent Pilati. And I had the full intentions of not going to Vincent Pilati. And then they took me with the ambulance. And then they did all the tests and stuff. And they did the angiogram. And then they could not open the blocked arteries with the angiogram. And then I was scheduled for, uh, for open heart surgery, which then took place two days later. What was in that lead up to the open heart surgery? Was there any sort of psychological preparation? What was going through through your mind? Because that can be extremely daunting. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big operation. Yes, now I was very, very scared, to be quite honest with you. I, when they first said the angiogram, I thought, oh, that's fine. The angiogram is not too bad. But uh, when they said to me after the, because as many people in the audience would probably know, angiogram they do when you are wide awake. And uh, when I realized then that that was not going to work for me and I have to go for this open heart surgery, I think the fear of God struck me like never before, you know. I was very, very scared. What were some of the thoughts and some of the discussions that you were having with, with your family and loved ones at the time? And didn't even raise the topic mm. because I was inside, I was burning up. And I thought, no, I'm not going to put pressure on the family now because uh, it might just upset them as well. Yes. And I thought, let, let me just contain it within myself. Yeah. How did the operation go? Was it a success? Uh, the operation was a tremendous success because uh, just before that, it was the Friday, then the surgeon, it was a Dr. Bussey, he said to me, I can go home just for the weekend, yes. but I must come back on Sunday, then they'll do me on Monday. So I thought, hey, this guy is sending me home now just to go say my goodbyes at home. Because oh, no. <laughs> I, I, I might not come back after this lot, you know. And then uh, the Sunday, his wife, who was his secretary, I think she still came to me and she said to me, uh, do you have enough money to pay for this operation? Or do you have gap cover? Because I had medical aid. Yes. And I said to her, no, I don't have gap cover on my medical aid. And then she reassured me and she said to me, don't worry, we'll just write it off. So I thought at least I can die in peace. There won't be debt left, <laughs> you know. There won't be debt for the family to pay the medical aid. And then it was scheduled for the Monday and the Monday it was fine. Everything went very, very well. You want me to continue? Please, because there was <laughs> okay. something else which also happened yeah. after this particular yes. operation. The, the bypass, it was a triple bypass. It was right? a triple bypass, yes. And it was a success. But then right. something else happened to, to Clive when you were being wheeled out of the operating theater? Uh, yes. Well, actually, they, they wheeled me out. I went back to the ward. And then two days after the operation, yes. then uh, another lady came into my life again. It was a young lady. She was the physio. And uh, she was very small in stature. And she came and uh, had to take me just for my exercises because they walk you up and down the corridor there just to exercise. And as uh, she walked me down the corridor, I just collapsed. And that's when I suffered the stroke. And uh, I still remember very clearly just going down like a sack of, or a ton of bricks or something. It just fell to the floor. And then I couldn't remember anything after that again. And you don't remember what led to you passing out? There wasn't a, a feeling of pain that overwhelmed you? Or Absolutely anything nothing. that you recall? No, it just mm. came out of the blue. I just collapsed there. And then uh, that's when my hero came into the picture, then Dr. Raoult. I think he is present here. I can't see now from here. Yes, no, he is one of I the I think the Dr. Raoult is here. Dr. Raoult was then summoned or called rather, to come to my aid. And, you know, ironically, at that particular time, Dr. Raoult was supposed to be seeing a patient who did not pitch. So the appointment was cancelled. And then Dr. Raoult came, and Dr. Raoult did everything. Phoned around to get this, apparently you need a specialist surgeon because I was diagnosed with a clot on the right side of my brain which paralyzed me completely on the left side. From head to toe, I was paralyzed completely. And then uh, Dr. Raud arranged everything and he came and then I was rushed back into theater again and they actually removed that clot. And the next day, I was perfect. 
was fine. No after effects, nothing after being paralyzed completely from the left side. Down. Speech was fine, body movements was fine. Everything. Your brain functioned fine. Right. Well, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But everything was fine. And it was that young lady, the physio, who raised the alarm after I had collapsed. You have wonderful women in your life. Absolutely. And now, angels there, and, now, and now the best part is I'm stuck with another woman who's now looking after me, which is my wife, which I've also got to say thank you to. So those three women and Dr. Raoud played the most important part in my life. Having had three heart attacks and a stroke, has it affected your, your outlook on life or the way you view your life in any way? I think you appreciate life now. You appreciate things much more than what you did before because, you know, before you lived a very free and easy lifestyle, not worried about, the, you know, eating correctly and things like that. But after going through this experience, you learn to appreciate life much more. Mm. Brian, do you have a similar feeling to what Clive was saying in terms of being more appreciative of life, having come through a heart attack as well? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's no doubt that you, you have a different perspective. Um, you look at things slightly differently. I think, you know, depending if, if when you're a lot younger, you tend to be, uh, you tend to have a, a sort of, well, I'll just carry on mm -hmm. point of view. But uh, when you're a bit older, it definitely makes you take stock of what you have and, and appreciate that you still have it. You had a very different story to, to what Clive was describing. You were active individual, sports person, hockey player. One would never associate an active lifestyle with a heart attack, yet it, it occurred. What had happened, Brian? So I've had no um, of, the, of the classical heart disease, disease symptoms in terms of, or, or um, markers in terms of cholesterol or being you know, grossly overweight. I was relatively fit. I'd been running um, half marathons. I've been play, I played hockey for you know, 40 odd years. Um, and I was literally on the, in the middle of a hockey match about 15 minutes into a game at the Western Province Cricket Club playing the, uh, the Summer League uh, Masters hockey. Uh, ball got broken down, slipped to me. I was playing a striker. I was on my own, went into the circle and having played against the same guys for so many years, I knew what the keeper was going to do. And as I started to pull the ball to go around him, I can only describe what I call a big whoosh. It's, it's a similar feeling to when you stand up too quickly and you feel a bit lightheaded mm. and you sort of feel that you want to drop down. But it was just a complete body, body emptying whoosh. And effectively, I, I guess from that moment on was clinically dead. Um, my heart had stopped and I wasn't, I wasn't breathing. Um, so I was very fortunate and for two reasons. One is that I was um, at Western Province Cricket Club where they have uh, an automatic electronic defibrillator, which I think I was the fourth or fifth person that it resuscitated. And secondly, I was very fortunate that one of the opposition was uh, Professor Bob Bagri, who's, who, was, um, who identified straight away that I was blue. Uh, my teammates thought I'd been knocked out because I landed on the goalkeeper, and the poor goalkeeper thought he'd killed me. Um, <laughs> And so they started, so Bob started CPR and they, uh, they brought the, A the AED and literally I was lying in the circle for 45 minutes while they continued with CPR. They defibrillated me four or five or maybe six times, I don't remember. Uh, so I have, I have, all that I've told you after the whoosh is, is anecdotal, it's been told to me. Um, and then I, I remember coming around at some stage, apparently I was very rude, but I deny that. Um, but I can vividly see Bob's face above me and he was doing compressions and it was so sore and I think by then the, the paramedics had arrived in the ambulance and they'd managed to find a vein and hang a drip and they'd got oxygen on me and, and then I'd sort of, I'd started to breathe properly on my own and um, I started to fight to try and get the mask off and roll over and they were, they were still holding me down and I think then the paramedics gave me some sedative, and I woke up um, a few se several hours later in the emergency room at uh, Vincent Pilotti. And when was the 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 operation conducted? So 
I ended up not, I didn't have an operation. So my backstory was that in 2015, um, I went to my doctor in, in the January with what I thought was um, uh, heartburn, which I, which I got while I was running. And every time I stopped running, um, I didn't, uh, I, the, 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 the heartburn went away. And my GP basically diagnosed me with a heart murmur and very, very shortly after that, I ended up having a, an aortic valve replacement uh, surgery. And in fact, Clive just reminded, he, he was thinking since we met on Friday, that he and I were actually in the same ward together in February 2015 in Vincent Pilotti. He was my in the word. bed on my left, yeah. Yes. He remembered yeah. that, not me. Yeah. Um, so, so, my, so, sorry, so my brain function is working correctly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and mine isn't. Yeah. So I, yeah. So that, so that was a backstory. But from what I, from what I know from from the clever doctors, is that what I had was was not related to the surgery at all. I had the valve replaced. I made a full recovery. I'd started running again. That was why I was playing hockey. Everything was fine. And what I understand that I had was a was a fairly rare. Um, rupture of plaque in my artery, which the body detected as a bleed, sent clotting agents. I had a clot, unfortunately, it clotted perfectly. Unfortunately, it was in the coronary artery, so my heart basically stopped. So that was the, so the, so the, so the surgery was a few years before, and um, for lack of information, the, the, the specialists, the, uh, the two, two, two cardiologists who, who dealt with me, Adi Hia and Dr. Milne, they thought it was an electrical issue, and they scheduled to put an um, a, a, a internal defibrillator in, uh, into my, just underneath the collarbone on, on the Friday. And on the Thursday night, they did an angiogram, the this, this same thing that, uh, that Clive had, just to double check that, that everything was still fine. And lo and behold, there was the clot, which um, Eddie was able to put a stent in, and the operation for the defibrillator was cancelled, and with I went di home. With Clive, uh, with the diagnosis, sorry, Brian, with the diagnosis of the heart murmur you mentioned a few years ago, was there a, a, a risk that it could develop into into a heart attack at some stage? Um, I don't. That that was never spoken. It, you know, the, the the theory was that it wasn't dangerous at that point, but it was mm. going to be needed to be done sooner rather than later, and the more. The more the valve leaked, the more strain that would be put on the heart, which could cause long-term damage. So that the decision was, I went to see the surgeon and he said, well, how about next Tuesday? And so I went in. So I went through the same um, sort of uh, pre-operation panic, the fact that when you realize that you're going to be there, they're going to you know, crack your chest like you see on, on, on TV and uh, they're going to stop your heart and cut it open and do bits and pieces in it. It's, it's, a, it's quite a scary thing. So. You mentioned that a lot of what had happened to you after that, that feeling that you had and that you blacked out was anecdotal, was told to you afterwards. How were your teammates affected by what had happened to you? So this is, and I think this is to me, it's probably the most important um, message that I I've, that I've, would like to give, is the fact that it happened to me, I was basically out for 45 minutes um, there was the potential of the operation which was negated by the stent and I went home and I was literally back at the hockey field the next Tuesday, not playing, uh, because Bob in his uh, um, zealous administration of CPR managed to crack a few ribs, which if anybody's had fractured ribs, it's, it's very sore. It's probably more painful than when I had the, the, uh, the, the, the operation on the chest. Um, and so I went back to hockey and you know, people had been had been asking what had happened, and I and I realised that what on that Tuesday night, probably well over a hundred people went home that night, not knowing whether I was alive or dead, and all they saw was the back of the ambulance going out the gate, because um, there were the team, the team, my teammates, the team we played against, the two teams on the other field, the next four teams that had come down for the next game, which was postponed because I was still lying in the middle of the circle, they couldn't play around me. Um, and it was when I started to, to hear those people's stories and about how it affected them, then that actually bounced back on me. So it's not, it, it, I mean, it did affect me, obviously, but I think it, what affected me more than anything else was the effect that was what, the effect that it had on other people and how that came back to me. And I had a drink with a friend of mine the other night and he said, you know, it actually make you, it almost makes you feel, you know, it gives you an indication that you do mean something to people. That you that you're part of their life and that they would be presumably sad if you if I hadn't made it 
Um, also, I suppose, that. also just showing that we're not in this alone, as you mentioned there as well, Brian. Yeah. It, it, has a, it has a ripple effect, um, heart attacks. Uh, uh, Clive, your colleagues, your former colleagues, your family, um, how did it impact upon them what you had experienced? Yeah, <coughs> pardon. I can only imagine what it did to them because, mm. uh, especially in my wife, because, you know, the two of us are alone now. We've got one son who's out of the house already. So she was alone, and that was always my biggest concern when I was in hospital. What's going to take, what is going to happen to her, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the stress that it put on her must have been out of this world, you know? Brian, what advice do you have for, for others? For those who don't have heart attacks. <laughs> yeah. And how do you advise not having that? <laughs> Well, that's the, that's the strange thing. In my case, you know, I was, I was as I said, I was reasonably healthy. I was, yeah. I was not grossly overweight. I mean, clinically, I probably was a little bit pudgy. I probably drank too much beer and probably still do. Um, but, I, you know, it was, it was a shock to me. Even the heart surgery, even the valve failure was a, was a shock to me because, you know, it just it seemed to be completely um, out of the blue. And the heart attack was way out of the blue. Uh, because everything seemed to be fine, and I was sort of back on track. I was planning on continuing to run and get fit again and maybe try and do some more half marathons and stuff. Mm. So um, clearly, I don't know whether any of... It, with, with, I mean, I always had the normal checkups, and obviously after the surgery, I would have an annual checkup, and everything was fine. So mine was really weird, and I'm, and I'm sure Adi will confirm that it's you know relatively rare occurrence. But obviously, anybody who who you know, feels that they're not well, they've got a sore tummy or whatever the case may be, don't, don't put off going to, to get it checked out. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please give our guests and our heart and stroke survivors a round of applause <laughs> for kindly sharing what would have been a very difficult and trying experience with us. We certainly appreciate it, Clive and Brian. Thank you so much for sharing those stories. Remember our hashtag. Make sure you're welcome, certainly, to continue sharing your, your observations and sharing your thoughts around these discussions. Um, hashtag heart and stroke at Brimstone Limited at Life Healthcare underscore. At this point of the discussion, I'd like to invite our panel of experts to come join us on stage, please, and I'll introduce them one by one. Dr. Amanu. Nula Rawat is a neurologist. Dr. Rawat, would you please join us on stage, please? Dr. Adrian Horak is a cardiologist. He's also going to form part of the panel and be joining us uh, in discussion. Eddie, I think you're here. On that side. You can come and hold my hand. Dr. <laughs> Ibrahim Kader is an interventional radiologist. Dr. Kader, thank you so much uh, for your time. If you can make your way to, to my left, thank you very much. Dr. Ibrahim Dandria is an emergency physician. Dr. Dandria, thank you so much. Yes, you're on the on the my right hand side. The CEO of the Heart and Stroke Foundation, I'm so glad that she's also forming part of the panel discussions. I've interviewed her a few times on The Honest Truth, Professor Pamela Naidu. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much for, for your time and for joining us. We have a dietitian also forming part of our discussion, Denise Karen. Denise, thank you so much for your time. And you're on my left, Denise. Thank you so much. Laura Perry is a physiotherapist. Laura, thank you also on my left. McKinley Andrews is a speech therapist, very important with rehabilitation. She joins us as well on my left as well. McKinley, thank you. Last but definitely not least is our a paramedic, Sarah Higgins. Sarah, thank you so much for being a part of the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, do remember that as a part of the heart and stroke discussions brought to you this evening by Brimstone and Life Vincent Pilati Hospital, you're very welcome to share and raise any questions. We have a panel of experts who are joining us this evening, so please do take advantage of the wealth of information that is here uh, and do ask them questions. I'll, I believe the Radio Zibonele, uh, Voice of the Cape, 
Uh, your listeners as well can certainly send through their questions via their respective uh, platforms. If I can start with uh, Dr. Horak. Um, Dr. Horak, what are the various heart conditions that one can encounter? Okay, that, uh, what we've been focusing on tonight has been heart attacks as such, which implies usually that an artery has become blocked with a clot or a ruptured plaque, and that's what kills most of people with heart disease. There are many other aspects of heart disease. There's the electrical arrhythmias, there are valvular problems, etc. But I think time will kind of preclude us talking about heart disease as a huge subject, yeah. and let's focus on heart attacks tonight, which is really the, the brunt of it. Yeah. And I think Brian's story is excellent because there are two aspects that he's brought out. One is the importance of immediate and expert attention when something goes wrong. That is really, time is critical. The other is the prevention, and I, I'd use that word with, uh, uh, with trepidation because we don't prevent it. Brian is a typical example. He shouldn't have had it. He didn't deserve it, but it can still happen. All the risk factors we will talk about later will make it more likely that you get it. And what we can try and do is reduce the odds and the chances of it happening. I wish we could prevent it. That's going to be another aspect for the future. We are working on things that will prevent it. But at the moment, as it stands, reduction of the, 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 the incidence would be important. So you're saying there's some exciting developments in the future? Oh, yes, they're coming. <laughs> Dr. Aman Lula Rawat is a neurologist also joining us um, in discussion to, to my left. Dr. Rawat, to my knowledge, you get two types of strokes. Can you explain to the audience the difference between the two? Yeah, I, I think firstly we need to start off by saying that a stroke, because there's this perception out there that a stroke, still by some people, the stroke involves the heart, but in fact a stroke involves the brain. And there are two types of strokes, as you say. One is where a vessel or an artery gets blocked, and that area can get damaged. So it's by a clot, it gets blocked by a clot. And depending on, obviously, where the area gets damaged will depend on how the patient might manifest. The second type of stroke is when an artery uh, ruptures and there's a bleed in the brain, and that's called a, a cerebral hemorrhage. And by far the most common cause of strokes are the first type, um, where the artery gets blocked, and that's called the cerebral infarction. How important is time when, when treating an, uh, with a stroke? Crucial. So the sooner you get there, we've got effective treatments, as you heard from Mr. Liberty already. Yes, yes. Um, the sooner you get to hospital, the better the outcome. So we're looking at within four and a half hours uh, of onset of symptoms, and as Dr. Kader will also elaborate on in terms of intervention, um, six hours and, and longer, yeah. So crucial, time is absolute crucial. How difficult was Clive's operation? Well, I didn't do the operation. <laughs> <laughs> I worked Mr. Liberty up and it's interventionists like Dr. Kader would uh, mm. elaborate more on that, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rawood. Dr. Ibrahim Dundria is an emergency unit physician. I would imagine, Dr. Dundria, that time is also absolutely critical when in an emergency situation. Yeah, um, we, we measure critical time points, door to needle, door to stroke, door to intervention. Um, uh, so the key thing with the time is that the time that the onset of the condition occurs to the time of treatment, you've got a very limited window. For strokes, it's up to four and a half hours. But remember, that doesn't mean that you can come into the emergency room four hours, 15 minutes down the line. We still need to do a number of tests before we can provide the treatment. So sometimes those tests, we try to keep them to within 30 minutes, but that means that you've got to present at least at four hours after the onset. So, so time is absolutely essential with both strokes and heart attacks. We have a slightly longer window with heart attacks, up to 12 hours, but the earlier we provide the intervention, the better the outcome is going to be. Because mm -hmm. every minute that passes, cells are dying. After examining the patient, what is the protocol that you follow for heart or strokes? Okay, so the key thing is to make a reliable diagnosis. The, the, the treatments that we use are, are very strong medications. They can have dangerous side effects if used in the wrong patient. So the first thing is that we, we do some simple interventions. In the case of a, of a suspected heart attack, the main test would be an ECG. In the case of a stroke, the main test is to do a CT scan. The treatment for both heart attack and stroke are either medications to bust up the clot, we call them clot busters, mm -hmm. or putting a, a, a long wire into the artery 
and pulling out the clot and taking it away. So with a stroke particularly, it's very important to distinguish between the bleeding stroke and the clotting stroke. Because if it's a bleeding stroke and you give a clot buster, you've essentially killed that person. So, so, so those, that's the main protocol. So as soon as the patient comes in, we do some initial workups, initial assessment, get the ECG. We try to do the ECG within 10 minutes, do the CT scan within 30 minutes, and then make a diagnosis from there. Um, at Vincent Pilotti, we've got, a, we've got a cath lab. It is a heart center. So we, if the patient is having a heart attack, we take them straight to the cath lab where cardiologists like Dr. Hyrock would uh, take over. Do remember, ladies and gentlemen, that you're certainly welcome to sh share any of your thoughts or reflections uh, as part of our discussions. Hashtag heart and stroke uh, at Brimstone Limited at Life Healthcare underscore. Dr. Dr. Carter, you are an interventional radiologist. What is an interventional radiologist? It sounds like an existential question. Thanks, Benita. Um, an interventional radiologist is radiologist, which is someone who reads x-rays or CAT scans, but who performs minimally invasive treatment procedures. So whether that might be for strokes, for liver tumors, for kidney problems, etc. Uh, from a stroke point of view, I promised myself I wouldn't call a stroke a brain attack. We all know what a heart attack is, but a stroke, we tend to adopt an approach well. You've suffered damage to your brain, and that's pretty much all that, that's all she, she wrote. Mm -hmm. You then need to go for rehabilitation and whatever deficit you have is what you have to deal with. But that is not the case. If you view a, a stroke as a, as a brain attack, then I think you start treating it with the same sense of urgency. And to put it into perspective, for every minute that your brain is deprived of oxygen, you lose about 12 kilometers of circuitry, of wiring in the brain. Or you lose, in about four minutes, the equivalent of the population of the whole planet in nerve cells, in brain cells. And those sounds, sounds really dramatic, but it doesn't give you any perspective of how serious the damage is. And if I could try and put that in perspective, for every hour that your brain is deprived of oxygen, you, your brain ages by three to four years. So if you say, well, I've had a stroke, I rushed to hospital, it's taken me three hours to get treated you are still 10 years older from a mental point of view than you were beforehand. So time is of the essence. We've spoken about prevention. And as Adi says, that's a whole different conversation. What we're trying to raise here is the awareness that you need to recognize the pathology, whether it's a heart attack or a stroke that may present typically or atypically, that you need to get to the appropriate center as soon as possible, and you need to get treated. And study after study has shown that just getting to a hospital is not good enough. If you want to be treated for a stroke, you need to get to the proper hospital. And with all the clot busters, with all the interventional fancy neuroradiologists, etc., the best treatment that you can do for a stroke is getting to a proper stroke center. From an interventional radiology point of view, it's important to realize that 90% of strokes are going to end up with Dr. Raut and Dr. Andrea. Only 10% of strokes end up with an interventional neuroradiologist. And what we do is, for those clots that won't be dissolved by clot busters, for that clot that is too large, we physically extract the clot, either by dragging it out with a special sort of mesh or stent, or sucking the clot out with a special aspiration catheter. And we've shown indisputably that that makes a long-term difference in patient outcome. And results may be are always dramatic, but maybe as dramatic as the patient being completely paralyzed and unable to talk, to talking to you during the procedure and getting up off the table. Wow. So we're looking at the difference between complete paralysis and dependence and complete independence. Mm. Can the brain recover the, the lost circuitry after a stroke or is it forever lost as, opposed, as going through the stroke, as a result of the stroke? That, that, that's an interesting question. The, the, the test that we do aims to identify the amount of brain tissue that has died, and those cells are irreversibly lost. And what we're looking for is trying to identify cells that are at risk of dying. And if we can save those, you salvage function. And cells that have died, depending on the plasticity of the brain, you might find that some of their function may be taken over by other parts of the brain. Mm. If I can move on to Denise Karen, who's our dietitian, uh, joining us this evening. Denise, prevention is better than cure. 
what food should we be avoiding or eating more of to, to prevent a heart attack or a stroke? So for a heart attack and stroke, we focus on a healthy, balanced diet, which is evidence-based, which means that we have studied different populations um, and people to see which um, ways of eating improve health. So there are scientific studies to back up what we teach patients. It also has to be sustainable. So nothing short-term that you can't do over a long period of time. It needs to be a sustainable way of eating that you can do for the rest of your life. So what do we eat? Um, you get three uh, main uh, macronutrients in the diet, carbohydrates, proteins, and fat. And then you get your micronutrients, which are your vitamins and your minerals. So your carbohydrates would include your breads, your starches, um, your uh, fruits and your veg. And there we want to do a whole grain. And I don't know if you've heard of the five-a-day campaign, which, is your, which are your fruits and vegetables, where we aim for five portions of fruit and veg every day. Actually, as human beings, we need nine portions of fruit and veg every day to get all the necessary nutrition, but that's not possible in all populations, so we work and aim at five. Then with your, um, your starches and so forth, we want in whole grains because it carries more vitamins, more minerals, and fiber. Uh, your proteins would be your meat, your chicken, your fish, your eggs, you find protein in your milk products. Those are very important as well, particularly fish, um, with regard to your cardiovascular health and brain health. Your fish has omega-3 fatty acids in it. It's a type of fat, which um, does play a role, a very important role. And then red meat we want to limit, not because of the meat itself, not the, the protein, but because of the types of fats with your red meats. And we'll talk about fat later. And then chicken and um, other lean foods like um, ostrich, um, and all types of poultry um, and pork. Um, you can make it quite lean because you, the fat is able to be removed and then you're left with the pure protein. But unfortunately with red meat, especially lamb, you get the marbling of fat through the meat and therefore um, you can't remove it um, very well, so you still get quite a lot of fat. Then your fats, you get um, saturated fats, which we want to limit in the diet. Those are your animal fats, so any fat from an animal source, um, except fish. So the fat in your milk, that's why we encourage low-fat um, milks, and your fats around your red meats and your chicken, etc. those are the fats that contribute towards heart disease and cholesterol. Your healthy fats are your um, polyunsaturated fats and your mono unsaturated fats. Mono unsaturated fats particularly are healthy for you and um, are protective of the heart. And those would be your olive oils, your avocado, your uh, sesame seeds, etc. And you can look this up. You can, you can look it up on the internet. And then your vitamins and minerals, if you're eating the right carbohydrates, proteins and fats, then you generally get in the correct vitamins and minerals as well. So that is basically what a healthy balanced diet looks like. You want to not eat a lot of salt. Um, and we do have many um, national salt campa campaigns that are run from government level where the community dietitians monitor salt in foods. We even take foods off the shelves that are high in salt or we um, approach food industries to lower the amount of salt in their, in their foodstuffs, like for example, potato chips. Um, so that was salt, and then your fluids. You want to have 30 mils of fluids at least per kilogram body weight. And that the average person, that would be two to two and a half liters of fluid a day. Thank you. Diet Dan. in a nutshell. But very important besides diet, try not to smoke. Smoking on its own is a risk factor for heart disease and stroke, whether you're following a good diet or not, and you must bring in exercise as well. Very important exercise. Imperative. Thank you, Denise. McKinley, you are a speech therapist. How does stroke affect one's speech, and how is this, this remedied? Um, stroke can affect your speech, language, and your swallowing, safe swallowing as well, um, in many different ways. Mm. 
In terms of speech, we have we hear a lot of slurred speech where it's difficult to understand what the person is saying. Um, we have uh, conditions where you know what you want to say, but you just can't get the message from the brain to the mouth. And it's very frustrating for our patients. And then we get language uh, difficulties as well, where sometimes our, our stroke patients can't understand what you're saying. They struggle to follow instructions, struggle to keep up with the conversation. And then there's expressive difficulties where they can't, they can't think of the words, they can't name objects, they can't string sentences together. So overall, it's very frustrating, um, you know. And in terms of swallowing, we have a lot of our stroke patients where um, eating and drinking starts to become difficult. They cough and they choke. And this can be quite dangerous because it leads to chest infections or pneumonia. Um, and often temporarily need feeding tube. Um, and in terms of remedying all these things, we do a lot of um, uh, word retrieval tasks and strategies, lots of drill work, lots of sensory uh, stimulation and oral motor exercises, um, and then varying various uh, swallowing exercises and um, yes. <laughs> Thanks, McKinley. Okay. Laura, Laura, you a, a physiotherapist here this evening. Is physical or occupational therapy essential in the recovery or rehabilitation of a stroke and or heart attack? Yes, probably much more for a stroke because of all of the deficits that result following a stroke. So some patients who are not able to get the class busting treatment or mostly patients who don't who aren't able to arrive in time within that window, they can suffer a lot of problems. Like Clive mentioned, the whole one side of his body was completely unable to move. And you can get that to varying effects. Sometimes people just have weakness, but sometimes they have complete inability to move one side of their body. But you can also get a huge range of other problems. You can get problems within your thinking, within your memory, within your ability to know where your body is in space. You can get problems with your vision, speech and swallowing issues. So it can really affect your life in a huge amount of different ways. So a physio and an occupational therapist will work with people who have these kind of problems to get you back to what you wanted to do. So physio works more on the physical side of things. Things like moving in bed, sitting, standing, walking, maybe exercises that you used to enjoy. And then an occupational therapist will work more on the, the mental side of things and also getting you back to your occupation, getting you back to work, getting you back to driving and back to your hobbies. And these are very integral to getting back your quality of life. Thank you so much, Laura. Very important information. Ladies and gentlemen, and if I can ask if the house lights could be just turned up slightly, um, just to enable the, the panelists here to see those asking questions. You're very welcome to certainly ask any of our panelists uh, any questions that you may have, heart and stroke related questions. Remember too to share your, your observations as well as some of the important discussion threads, uh, online hashtag heart and stroke or at Brimstone Limited at Life Healthcare. So if there, I'm sure there are roving microphones around. If there are any questions from, from you, please put up your hands. There is there are individuals out there with microphones that will assist you. In the meantime, Professor Naidu, CEO of the Heart and Stroke Foundation, are you able to elaborate on what the Heart and Stroke Foundation uh, offers the community? Yes, thank you so much. May I just say at the outset, though, the one thing that I do want to emphasize is um, to look at health holistically. And I think our wonderful um, multidisciplinary team here tonight uh, really epitomizes that. So, you know, for all of you out there, you, it's, you know, it's everybody's a cog in the wheel. Um, and the Heart and Stroke Foundation is a very important part of this team as well. The reason for that is because we would really like more people in South Africa to know, to be aware, not just about what happens once you have the event. So we don't only want to talk about what happens once you've suffered a heart attack or a stroke. I think that's critical. I think we need to look at life um, or, and health more holistically though, because <coughs> medical intervention is absolutely critical 
the timing of it is, is, as you've heard, is also very important. However, I think that one has to remember that the risk factors for many of these disease conditions are rather common. So, you know, yes, heart diseases and strokes, a circulatory health, as we call them, um, as a cluster of, of health conditions, have common risk factors. So it's really important the Heart and Stroke Foundation encourages you to know your numbers. It sounds rather cliched, but it's really important for you to know, um, you know, what is your blood pressure. If you feel you are at risk, you should have that done pretty often, at least once in six months. If you're really healthy once a year, you go to your physician and you have your check. Um, so it's important to know your blood pressure. It's important to know your cholesterol levels. It's important to know that, uh, you know, what is five grams of salt a day? You know, this is what the World Health recommend, Organization recommends uh, for an adult to have in their diet. But what does constitute five grams? You know, what is a five teaspoon? So we try and... Um, educate the public as to exactly what, you know, what is this one teaspoon? How does it pan out in a diet for an individual, uh, for an adult person? So I think it's, we try at the Heart and Stroke Foundation to really be advocates for health, for heart health and brain health, as we call it. Um, so please do call us. We also run a very important Mend at Hearts group, which we very kindly partner with life uh, healthcare as well. So we run these once a month, um, usually towards the end of the month, like around the last week. Um, and it's really, everybody's welcome. So it's, you know, people who have suffered um, heart disease or strokes, uh, their families, their friends, and anybody who really wants to know more about these conditions. Um, the one thing that I'm starting to focus more on, and I hear it tonight, and I, I'm really heartened to hear that, you know, the post-event, because I think there's not enough awareness in the community around rehabilitation. Um, so that is another, you know, we could give you leads on that. We, we would be able to, to help you uh, go to the right people. Obviously, Life Hospital does, but I think that, you know, we, we need to work together as a team. Um, so we would be able to help you with that. Uh, we also advocate with government. So we play quite a key role in policy. Um, so we're very fortunate in the private sector, but we would like, so one of the things we do, uh, because we are a foundation and a nonprofit, is to really work uh, in a private-public partnership because we'd like to see more people in the country being offered uh, you know, better health care. And then I just want to kind of finish off by saying that please, you know, once you've had an event, uh, if you've suffered a heart attack or a stroke, you really need to be aware of the cumulative risk factors. So a lot of people feel, okay, I've, you know, I eat well, um, and I've kind of been healthy for many years, um, and I didn't really need to exercise. So I think once I've had a heart attack, I think I'm gonna add the, the you know, the exercise to what I'm supposed to do. And so I think it's really about persisting to ensure that you don't reduce the number of cigarettes, but you stop it, because tobacco is an absolute killer. So you know, you need to know these things. This kind of awareness has to be created um, around us. So the cumulative risk factor, so your doctor, when you go to your physician the next time, uh, talk about the risk factor score. What, what does that mean, you know? So do you have a genetic history? So we said earlier, Benita, oh, I think it was you who mentioned, or it might have been Ms. Bray, um, who mentioned that, um, you, you know, 70 to 80% is really hereditary or genetically, pre, you're predisposed. Of course, there's also structural defect, and our body is a, a kind of a human machine. But 80% is really about behavioral and lifestyle factors. So we can change the course of things. So even if you've had an event, um, if you live a healthy lifestyle, it reduces your risk factor score quite dramatically. So, and we'd like to think that the Heart and Stroke Foundation can help to do that. So do call us, thank you. Thanks, Professor Naidu. Ladies and gentlemen, feel free, if you do have any questions, to certainly raise your hands. We do have a gentleman who can assist you with a microphone to get your questions through. Um, if there, are any, there is a lady over there who can assist you. Um, do we have any questions? Sorry, I 
if the house lights can just go on so we can have a look. Yes, there is a gentleman yeah. over there. So yes, sir. This um, is um, for the dietitian. I'm a quite active person, um, but the one thing in my diet is I can't eat fish anymore. I'm allergic, so what do I supplement it with that? Because I, I had hepatitis actually, and that is my downfall. Can you advise me on anything that I might use? Thank you. Okay, so the fish contains omega-3 fatty acids, and um, you can um, supplement your diet with that. Um, you want 1,000 milligrams of omega-3 in the form of fish oil, not plant omega-3, because um, that is the it has the particular um, chemicals essential for health. All right. We also have Sarah Higgins, who's our advanced life support paramedic, uh, joining us this evening. Important though, Sarah, because there's a distinction between what you do and normal first responders. This is what I'm led to believe. What is an advanced life support paramedic? Um, so in the pre-hospital setting, we have um, quite a few different qualifications. Um, mostly on your ambulance, you'll find a basic life support medic as well as an intermediate life support medic. Um, they have certain drugs and skills within their scope of practice. Um, and then you get advanced life support paramedics who have um, quite a few more drugs and quite a few more skills in their um, scope of practice. And um, particularly us who work out of Vincent Pilati Hospital, we work on a response vehicle. So if an ambulance arrives on a scene and they um, have a patient that they are unable to handle, that they will then call for backup and we will assist them um, with an extra scope of practice. Mm. And, and are the trauma units adequately resourced? Um, our trauma unit is very <laughs> adequately resourced. Um, yeah, so also um, within the private sector and the government sector, you also have different um, sort of facilities. So within communities, you have um, community health care centers, which are, have very, very basic care. Um, and then you have a more tertiary institutions, which are further out. So... Um, a lot of patients who don't know any better might just go to the closest facility which might not be able to cope with their specific condition and then they'll have to be transferred out to a tertiary institution that can assist with their um, condition. When you're called out on an emergency, what, do you, what are the symptoms you look for when, when treating a stroke or, or heart attack? Um, so particularly for a stroke, in the pre-hospital setting, we do a test called a FAST test, F-A-S-T, and um, members of the audience or lay people can do the test themselves as well. It's very simple. Um, so the F stands for facial droop. So you ask the patient to smile and show their teeth, and um, if they have a positive facial droop, you'll notice that half of their face um, sort of sags and only the one side will show the teeth. Um, so that's a positive facial droop. Then you have an arm drift, so you'll ask the patient to hold their hands out in front of them and close their eyes, and if one arm droops down or if they're unable to lift their arm at all, that's a positive arm drift. Um, you then have slurred speech, so you'll ask the patient to um, say a phrase like red lorry, yellow lorry, and if they struggle to say something like that, then that will be a um, problem with their speech. And then the T is for timing, so um, to get onto the phone immediately with your um, preferred emergency service provider, or if you have access to transport and you're able to load the patient into your vehicle, that would be the first prize to get the patient to hospital. But also when you're calling into the emergency services, if you've already done a fast test, you can mention to the call taker that the patient has a facial droop, um, arm drift, and they've got weakness on their one side, and that might um, ring the call taker's alarm bells to make it a priority case. Whereas if you just say, oh, my mother fell off the toilet, then they might log it as a priority two case, and you might only get an ambulance much later. Thanks, Sarah. Sarah, um, say if, I, if I may, sorry to yes. But Sarah made a very valid point and a very important point. And obviously, your, your emergency sort of response team is critical. But if you had to choose between waiting an hour and a half for an ambulance, uh, and you had an option to get somebody into a vehicle and get them directly to an emergency unit straight away, time is brain and time is heart muscle. And that would then be the preferred option. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor. Are there any other questions uh, from the audience? I know there was a gentleman who uh, wanted to ask a question. Listening to Professor yes. Naidu uh, about educating, so prevention is also better, you know, in the long run. Now, Denise, you know, all the time when you talk about eating, 
Sometimes you, you go through these phases in terms of Atkinson's diet and Bantam diet and vegan diet. I don't know what else. Can you just educate us a little bit more? What is <laughs> so we do get different types of diets, but let me just go back a little bit to the fact that the diet industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. So there are lots of fad diets and false diets as well because people make money off it. Because as soon as you reduce your calorie intake, the amount of energy that you eat, you will lose weight. But what we want is for you to be healthy while losing weight. And that health needs to carry right through from throughout the life cycle. So if you've got a family, the whole family should be healthy eating this way. Um, and you want, it to, you want to be able to eat like this for the rest of your life. So coming back to the different diets, at the moment, yes, panting and the ketogenic diet, etc. those are the popular diets at the moment. And then um, banting is particularly popular because a very popular scientist and doctor has promoted it. However, it is not indicated in heart disease, meaning that it is not a diet suitable for heart disease. High fat diets do play a role in epilepsy. We have seen that it does lower um, seizures. But for the general population, um, it is not advised. It does have long-term consequences um, in that it can cause cholesterol to those who are sensitive to it or have a family history or have risk factors. And also, unfortunately, with the high-fat diets, people tend to use a lot of the saturated fats in the diet, so butter. And then one um, very missing, there's a lot of missing information around this particular fat, and that is coconut oil. It is a saturated fat, it is not healthy, but it is very popular and very promoted by the diet industry because it makes money. <laughs> and it sounds healthy because it's, you know, coconut. And then the ketogenic diet is very similar to the banting diet. But, you know, if we could just stick to the basics, it, 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 it doesn't sound like fun to eat healthily. We all know it. We've heard it somewhere. We've read it somewhere. But it's really quite simple. Just eat the way um, we try and encourage you as scientists and dietitians. Well, not all scientists are on the same page, but as dietitians. <laughs> Dietitians are all on the same. Denise, page. is it about a balanced, a balanced diet? You know, yes. having your, having your proteins, having your vegetables, yes. um, all of those nutrients without yes. any extreme on either side, for example, and then possibly to support that with yes. some, some good vitamins as well. And then to be very careful not to exclude a food group. So if a diet says no fruit, banting, for example, that's a red flag. Low carbs. Um, that's a red flag. High fat, that's too much of a food group, that's a red flag. So as soon as something is out of moderation, it's a red flag that this diet is not right. You know, diets like um, the soup diet or the grape diet or the juice diet, something's wrong with that from what I've just told you. Can you see the red flags? It's one food group, a fruit diet or a juice diet, or maybe two, you know, but just be careful, be careful. Are there any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Thank yes, you. gentlemen. <coughs> Stroke in a TIA. Okay. So when you have a blocked vessel, the brain is then deprived of its blood supply. And then if there's damage to that area, that's called a stroke. If you're lucky enough and the stroke breaks uh, and the clot breaks up, um, you get reversal of your symptoms and, and signs. That's called the TIA, transient ischemic attack. So transient for transient, ischemic for lack of blood supply and attack, for brain attack, yeah. Mm. So the one's reversible, uh, it reverses rather, but we take that very seriously because that's one of the misperceptions out there that if I've had the symptoms and they go away, ugh, I'll leave it. But that's a warning that one might have a stroke coming. In fact, about 14% of patients are probably who had a TIA are going to have a, a stroke um, within the first three or two months. And then half of them 
of those patients are going to have the stroke within the first two days. So that's, you, we take that as serious as a stroke, yeah. So you come in immediately. Okay. Amanda, I want to endorse what you said. Don't ignore the warning signs. It's a bit like saying you're only slightly pregnant. You know, okay. it can get worse. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions, ladies yeah, and yeah. gentlemen? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm a recovering multi-stroke patient since February 2019. And since February, I've been living with a fear of a reoccurrence. What are the signs and symptoms that, I've been, that I need to look out for to be aware of it happening, happening to me? Because it, it was sudden. I wasn't aware I was having a stroke. I went to hospital many hours later. All right, I think we, we touched on that, but I'll just remind again. So depending on where... Um, the vessel is blocked will depend on how the patient might manifest. But I think, just to reinforce what my colleague has said there, I think to remember the word, the acronym FAST, and I'll repeat this, but I, th and I think that if there's going to be one take-home message tonight is recognition. Um, and F for face, facial droop. A for raise the arms and there might be a drift. S for speech. So patients either slurring their speech or they can't express themselves. T for time, we've heard that time is crucial. Every minute lost is about two million cells lost of the brain. And in fact, we also add B fast to the acronym. Add B for balance. So sudden loss of, of balance, either because if a patient's had a weak leg or there's incoordination and E for eyes, so sudden loss of, blur, loss of vision, blurry vision, or double vision. So remember the acronym, be faster. And th that should pick up strokes, probably in more than 80% of patients, even if you're a non-medical person. Thank you, Dr. Rawood. Are there any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? This question over here. Yes. Um, do you have any pearls of wisdom? I deal with patients regularly who are smokers and to try and motivate them to stop smoking, it's something that many people comment on, but besides preaching to them, because they all know it's not good for them. Any good suggestions from the panel? Well, this is purely anecdotal and not scientific, but within my own personal circle of colleagues and friends, I've seen about an 80% success rate with the book, The Easy Way to Quit Smoking by Alan Carr. That basically when people read the book, they realize how they've been programmed and it helps them to unprogram their thinking patterns, which makes it easier to break the chains of the smoking addiction by helping them to realize that they're addicted and break free. So that's available. You can get it at any bookstores, take it out exclusive, whatever. The Easy Way to Quit Smoking by Alan Carr. Um, an occupational a therapist. Can I just quickly assist? add a comment, uh, just following from this one? I think that we mustn't also underestimate me mental um, issues when, you know, mental health uh, when people have conditions like this. I think it does, I'm sure you've had a little bit of depression, anxiety. You know, these are triggers for the continuation of smoking. So I think that uh, you're reading a book, yes, for sure. But I think that if one recognizes there could be an underlying kind of anxiety or form of depression, form of sadness, difficulty in coping, then I think a mental health professional is quite important as well. Uh, so refer, uh, there are many very good mental health professionals who engage in smoking cessation programs. So please also um, look at that. Thank you, for Professor. We have time for a, a one or two more questions, ladies and gentlemen. If you do have any questions to direct to our panelists, now would be the time. Yes, sir. Okay, I just want to know what is the cause of short breath and intense pain like over your chest part? You say the cause. Okay, you've described symptoms that are often the result of an impending heart attack or something that's happening. If you block an artery that's going to your heart, it affects the function of the heart so it's not contracting well and you can get shorter breath. But you also have a vague, heavy pressure in the chest. That is the one. It's never a sharp, standing, stabbing, localized pain. That, that doesn't worry us. It's the more heavy, crushing pain that you get. People think, oh, it's indigestion, that type of thing. Let's have an aspirin, see what it's like in the morning. Aspirin's good, but don't wait for the morning. Get in and see someone, if there's any doubt. 
Thank you, Dr. Harik. Any other questions? Okay. Good evening. Yeah. I'm Blossom. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Over here. Okay. Good evening. I'm Blossom from Yabonga. Um, I am concerned because time has been indicated that it is crucial. And I'm from um, working for an organization that's working in disadvantaged communities, which is difficult to get to a hospital. And when you're there, uh, you have to wait 24 hours before a healthcare worker uh, attends to you. Number two, um, we, we're working with over 100 staff that are from those communities that, you know, this kind of awareness is very rare to find in our communities. It would be nice if the foundation can go to where we're working and raise this awareness with us. We would love to partner with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Are there any other questions? I think we have time for one or two more, two more. Yes, sir. Hi, good evening to the panel. Um, uh, I would like to pose this question to the panel, uh, to the doctors. Uh, it, it might sound like a silly question to, to some people, but I would like to pose this question. Uh, my mother had a heart attack a few years ago, and from the heart attack it lead to pleurisy. Um, I would just like to find out how did that actually happen, uh, because it's all been on my mind to ask this question. Thank you. Okay, uh, that's, that's, there's never a stupid question, it's only the answers that are quite stupid sometimes. Um, the heart attack affects the muscle of the heart. Now pleurisy is something completely different, it's an inflammation of the linings of the lungs. So there's all sorts of potential things that could have happened there. Maybe they had a secondary chest infection, maybe by lying in bed after a heart attack you get a clot in the leg, goes up to the lung and you have what's called a pulmonary embolus and a small uh, pulmonary infarct or something like that, but they're not directly related, the lungs and the heart are not, pleurisy and the heart are not directly related, but you could put it together somehow, I guess. Thank you, Doctor. One, we have time for one more question, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Hi, we've got a couple, a couple of questions from listeners uh, on the Voice of the Cape radio. Um, how many can we take? Um, let's take three, last okay, three, please. Right. Thank you. Um, this one says, most butters and margarines have a heart stamp or certification from the Heart and Stroke Foundation of South Africa. Does the stamp mean it's healthy to consume? Butters and margarines do not have the Heart and Stroke Foundation stamp on it. Medium fat spreads do, where there's 50% of polyunsaturated fats or monounsaturated fats. Um, margarine and butter have over 80% saturated fats. So if, you d if it does have the Heart and Stroke Foundation sign, it is endorsed and tested and therefore heart safe. Okay, the next question. What does one do in the event of seeing someone undergoing a CVA, especially if a hospital is at least 45 minutes away? Mm. Um, if the hospital is far away, obviously you'll try and call the closest emergency service. Um, they will be able to respond with lights and sirens, i.e. drive a little bit faster than your usual vehicle, um, if they can get to the person in time, um, to get the patient to the closest, most appropriate facility as soon as possible. Thank you. And then the last question, um, if your cholesterol is over seven, how do I treat it? Also, do I get a lot of, I do get a lot of acid buildup and a burning sensation over the chest. I'm 59 and very active. Well, I, I can take part of it. You can do the diet part. But there's no doubt, there's a, there's a lot of junk talked about cholesterol. It is well established that low density, LDL, the low density lipoprotein, is bad for your arteries. So the higher it is, the higher your risk, and you should get it down. And the best drug we have now that has dramatically changed heart attack rates in America, because they use it widely, are the statins. They seem to have got a bad rap, I don't know quite why, because they are magic drugs used appropriately in the right people. So if your cholesterol is over seven, it sounds like you need medication. You can't do it by diet alone. Mm, I agree. So with diet, you would cut back on your saturated fats and include your mono unsaturated fats to increase your HDL cholesterol which helps remove the cholesterol from the body. And then, of course, your fruit and veg and whole grains. Oats, for example, is a whole grain that helps remove cholesterol from the body. 
Thank you, Denise. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, time has got the better of us, but thank you for yours and a big thank you to our panelists who availed themselves this evening. Please give them a round of applause. Thank you as well to our uh, guests this evening who shared their stories. Thank you to Clive Liberty. And a big thank you to Brian Smith. Thank you, Brian. I'd now like to call upon Mustak Bray, who is the CEO of Brimstone and Chairman of Life Healthcare, to share the last few words with us this evening and to close our discussion. Thank you, Mr. Bray. Uh, good evening and assalamu alaikum to everybody. Uh, it was certainly a very, very educational session for me as well. Uh, I hope that each and every one who's come out on this cold evening in Cape Town has learned a lot. Uh, we've learned some new acronyms like FAST and be fast, and so it's, gonna, it's not just the speed at which we travel, but now I've learned some new things which I think all of us can learn from. Um, and then to our two survivors, Clive and Brian, I'm mean, just for sharing your personal trauma and the trauma your, your family went through with all of us and all the listeners on all the radio stations as well. Uh, thank you very, very much for doing that. Uh, I really found it very moving and, you know, the experience. The more we talk about it, I think the more each and every one of us can learn. And that's the main thing. That's one of the main reasons we at Brimson try to support these type of functions that we can all try and learn from each other, learn from the experiences. If we save one life, one extra life, we're doing something already. So to, to the two of you, really, thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart and from all at Brimstone for coming out and being brave enough to speak about it. Quite often, people aren't brave enough to speak about the trauma they've lived through. To our medical panel here, it's, it's great. I mean, um, yeah, it's a panty of life healthcare. I mean, uh, they, they, most of them work at Life Healthcare, so I'm very happy that they're here tonight. And it's good that they can share their experiences. And then just in line with that, if I can just remi uh, remind all the people who are here tonight, if I can give you another invitation. On the 21st of October this year, we're going to have a cancer awareness evening. We've had that for the last number of years as well, where we invite cancer survivors and the specialists in that to come and talk and, and share the experiences with us. So you can put it in your diary now already. On the 21st of October this year, we will have another one in the video. This art is in the same venue? Yeah, it will be in the same venue here this evening, uh, on the 21st of October. But then as I said to the medical panel, Dr. Harak, Raoult, Andrea, Dr. Kader, Professor Naidu, Denise Karen, Laura Perry, Bikina Andrews, and Sarah Higgins, thank you very, very much for your time and the effort that you put in. And just for sharing your many years of experience in the fields that you work in. And then uh, for the people who put this together, firstly, I've got to thank our anchor, Benito Vergottini from Smile 90.4. Thank you very, very much for conducting this function for us. It's, you've, you've really made it more interesting than I thought it could be. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and, and, and carry, on for the, uh, carry on with the good work. And then for our community radio stations who are here with us tonight as well, besides Smile 90.4, we had Radio Zibonele and Radio Voice of the Cape who carried this program live. We thank you very, very much for being part, our partners in this. And then to, the, to our partners at Life Vincent Pilotti, uh, Vincent Pilotti Hospital, uh, Smile 90.4 FM and the Heart and Stroke Foundation, thank you very, very much for just partnering with us at Brimson. Uh, you know, we at Brimson, we say we try to make a difference in people's lives. And this is one of the ways we try and do it in actual fact. So thanks very much for joining us in this venture. And then for the people who put the actual show together tonight, the Sar and Azima from our office, thank you very, very much. And also from Vince, uh, Vincent Pilotti, uh, Voganine uh, Johnson, for the assistance you've given us in putting tonight's function together. It's not the end of the evening. Uh, I'm sure all these professionals are going to be around there while we have some snacks afterwards. I'm not sure whether all the snacks are approved by the dietitian, so <laughs> if you can... <laughs> If you can maybe just turn a blind eye to some of those things. Uh, but we do have two of our, our associate companies. We've got both Oceana, which has got the Lucky Star brand, and, 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 I'm, and the Lucky Star portraits are, are, are the, you know, they approved. Uh, and we've got sea harvest over there as well with the white fish with hake and that, which is also approved. So 
we're going to try and do that. But then I think most importantly tonight is, well, I want you to, before you leave tonight, if you can visit the Life Healthcare desk outside. We know we've got a little fridge magnet over there uh, where we've got the emergency number for free advanced life support paramedic service. It's not an ambulance service, people. This is a paramedic service where our lady here works. She's one of the people that works in that. Uh, uh, and originally, the SAR came to me about a year ago, and he had one of these things done, which was about a quarter of the size. I said, Nisar, at my age, I can't see the numbers. <laughs> so please change the sign. So we, we made a much bigger fridge magnet uh, so that, you know, if there is an emergency and you need to call out these people, you can see the number. And as I said, it's not an ambulance service. A paramedic will arrive there, they'll come by car, and they'll try and be of assistance to yourselves. So please take, get one of these, take it with you, and put it on your, on your fridge at home. But once again, thank you very, very much to everybody for coming out here tonight, and thank you for being here. And I, as, as chair of Life Healthcare and as a CEO of Brimstone, I will just commit ourselves that we will carry on doing these type of programs in the future. God willing. Thank you very, very much.